Doctor, could you please give us your name and your job title? Uh, hi there, Jared Manoj Badali, uh, various titles. Um, <laughs> today I'm chairman of the British Asian Trust because we're launching an emergency COVID appeal for India. But uh, yes, tomorrow I'm the lead owner of the Rajasthan Royals. I got I got you on uh, partly because you wrote the book with Simon Hughes, and I was quite interested about it. One of my first questions about your book was, uh, it's called A New Innings. Um, everyone, you know, run out and buy it straight away. Uh, but one of the <laughs> things I was most interested about was you've actually, like it's called A New Innings, but you've actually been with Rajasthan for a long time. Uh, you know, yeah. you, why did you write the book now? Uh, well, I mean, I've sort of been in and around cricket for an even longer time. Um we were investing in county cricket, uh, which uh, sounds like a strange thing to do. Uh, back in 2005, we were um, you know, running a television show called Cricket Star in India back in 2006. So I've sort of been investing in and around cricket for a while. The, the, I think the, the, the honest answer to your question is there are sort of multiple versions of the book, right? So it was a kind of multi-year product. And I first started to write things down about the experience in the IPL frankly, because my business partner was so bored of hearing me come in every morning going, you couldn't make this up, you know, you, you couldn't write a script. And I think it was just his way of, you know, getting me out, you know, getting me out from listening. So you know, a lot of the stories were captured as the IPL journey. And there's no secret the Rajasthan Royals has been an extraordinary roller coaster. Mm. I mean, we've been involved in termination and suspension, spot fixing, yeah, we've won it. We've come last. I mean, there's sort of nothing we haven't done. Um, and you just want to capture those stories. But then I think during lockdown, um, there was an opportunity to wrap around those stories something useful, hopefully, around the business of cricket. Uh, personally, I've always been in, interested in the business of sport, um, but not that many people historically are or have been. But one of one of the consequences of the lockdown is suddenly – the business of sport became mainstream because the economics of the game were laid bare. People were worried about the economics. Um, and he, and the, the other sort of catalyst, you know, honestly, was that 2019 was such an extraordinary year for cricket, arguably one of its greatest ever years. But yet I personally feel we're at a really important inflection point. And if we get three or four things right, the game could absolutely fly. And if we get three or four things wrong, you know, we could be back, you know, where we were a few years as a sort of struggling niche sport. When, just to take you back to the start, when did you, I mean, you said you were involved in cricket for a while uh, before that, and uh, obviously you were, but when did you first hear of the rumour that there was going to be this, um, you know, Indian domestic league with franchise owners and these sorts of things? Probably 2007. Um, uh, I, you know, it's a, a long time ago now, but the... The first I'd actually heard was was from Lalit Modi himself because he was the vice chairman of the BCCI when the um, uh, when we had to get our television show endorsed by the BCCI. So that's where the sort of relationship began. And he he made no secret of, and in fact, I think he tried in two thousand and four to get a city league going. So there was no secret. Um, the ICL came along, and he made it clear that the BCCI were going to respond. But as I remember it. The original plan was to launch that in 2009. Um, and so what changed everything was India winning the World Cup. And I think, again, it was October 2007 um, and in South Africa. Uh, and that that was uh, c coupled with the fact that the ICL was starting to, you know, get players, get overseas players. Um, and then, you know, Lalit called me up one day and said, oh, by the way, those plans I told you about, we're bringing them forward a year. So if you want to get a prospectus, let me know. And I'm working with IMG. Did you did you see the sort of the future of it? Because I, I, my memory of the early part of the business model, and, and you'll remember this a lot better than me, but there wasn't a lot of money going back to the owners and teams are really, really struggling. So you, there's no way you could invest in something like the IPL without thinking that you were investing for a five or a 10-year period, I would have thought. So did you think this could be massive going forward? Yeah, look, it's always easy to be smart with hindsight. And <laughs> we, we, we clearly thought it was a sensible investment opportunity, otherwise we wouldn't have done it. But you're spot on about the economics in the sense that the thing that was clear to us was you'd, be ha you'd have to be able to invest for at least three to four years. Um, 
But I remember when we did our models, the only thing you could be certain of was, or not certain of, but the, the, the you know you could be more certain of was the television income, the television income levels, and what your what your annual franchise fee cost was going to be. And where we, as a you know, as the Rajasthan Royals saw an opportunity was if we could keep player costs low, then we and we and we didn't pay more than X for a franchise. You know, we just about got to a model that would lose a bit, but not lose a huge amount. Um, and in fact, I think from memory, we'd sort of budgeted to have cumulative, cumulative losses about fifteen to twenty million dollars. What a lot of people missed at the start was because the headline franchise fees were sort of 70, 80, 90, 100. A lot of people thought that's what was paid out, you know, that that was the size of check that you needed. Mm. But it was actually crystal clear in the prospectus that that money was paid over 10 years. So what you had to do was build a model and forecast what your losses were going to be. But as you said, to your first point, I think most people expected four to five years of losses. But, you know, again, you know, as we modeled it and as we thought about it, had it been a complete disaster, you you clearly wouldn't keep investing after years, two years, three. So your losses were capped at some level. Yeah. But as you as we've seen, the opportunity was, you know, if the thing flew, it would be very attractive. So uh, you know, I've obviously uh, you know I was a general manager of one of the um, CPL teams briefly, and uh, you know worked for you know quite <laughs> a lot of franchises, um, you know, ar- around over the last couple of years. There's a lot of hobby owners. There's a lot of owners who yeah. get involved because they see it as a, a way of getting David Warner on their Instagram page and, you know, all those sorts of things, which is fine if you have the money and you can afford to do it. And that, that was certainly the case within the IPL. We saw people who were very, very rich who were like, this is cool. We could have Kyron Pollard on our team and Lesif Malinga on our team. It never felt from day one that Rajasthan went in with that way. It always felt that you guys went in with a very, very business background and you thought, yeah. but, uh, you know, it's great. You know, if you're going to invest your money in something that's going to work, it'd be nice if it was cricket. But it was almost a secondary thing, I thought, to, to you guys. Then it was a good business decision and it happened to be cricket. Is that more how you saw it? Yeah, look, I think at first it's nice of you to say that. And I think that's sort of true, right? I mean, I, I, um, uh, I guess where we're perhaps a little bit different is, you know, we don't have um, major business interests in in India and, you know, therefore uh, some of that, um, some of those opportunities for kind of conflating the two, et cetera, you know, don't exist. Um, we always said that we want our franchise to be about the cricket first and foremost, because if we get the cricket right, which clearly last year, last season and, you know, even potentially currently this season, we haven't been, but if we get the cricket right, um, you know, I was massively inspired by uh, uh, by the whole Billy Bean, Moneyball story. You know, my, my day job is, um, you know, everything that I've been involved in building with my business partner, Charles, over the last 22 years has been in technology and data. So I'm a bit of a nerd in terms of believing that stuff is going to be really, really important for the game. And look, when you're investing your own money, I think uh, it's always surprised me actually how many really smart business people kind of leave their brains at the door when it comes to sports investing. But um, yeah, no, we, we always said, you know, we, we did all the boring stuff, right? We had budgets, we had board meetings, we had governance, we had um, all the things we do in all of our other Blenheim Chalcott businesses. We tried to tried to do and some we got right, and you know, we still made some some bad decisions along the way as well. The Moneyball stuff's obviously quite interesting, you know, especially for me as I've gone on to, you know, work in cricket analytics and, you know, being an analyst, as I was saying before. So it, it was it was there and thereabouts. Uh, I know, like, the odd county team would come up with something random. Um, and uh, obviously Krishna Tunga, the, 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 uh, the Indian, uh, had worked with John Buchanan. So it wasn't like no one was doing it. But it was done in a very small fry way. How did you go from not owning a cricket team to owning, you know, Oakland Athletics cricket team, essentially? Yeah, the um, in terms of the – just want to make sure I understand the question, Jared, in terms of the, 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 the analytics side of it? Well, yeah, like, I mean, if, if you think about it, when you, cricket is quite old-fashioned, as we, as we both know. Yeah. And yeah. there, were, there had been no template really in cricket to be as yeah. analytics driven so, as you guys were. And so you, yeah. it, was not like, it wasn't like baseball where it was filtering in slowly. You almost took it from zero to 100. So how, yeah. how, 
how do you have meetings with people with that or is it just if you're the team owner it's an easier uh, conversation thanks, thanks. thanks for clarifying it, it was a, it's a really simple answer actually um, you know i went outside of cricket so you know when we got the franchise i mean firstly we put our probability of getting the franchise is quite low because you know we knew we were operating you know to a specific budget so there were really only three franchises that were uh, we you know we we bid for two because you had to put your first choice, second choice, third choice. We bid for two already, so we weren't certain we were going to deal with it. But I remember the 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 I think it was January we got the franchise, and I think um, in February I spent two weeks in the US uh, um, meeting with a whole from a cross section of sports, meeting with a number of the. Um, the, you know, the leading sporting franchises to not just learn about analytics, actually just to learn about how they ran a sports franchise, you know, what, what they were doing with content, what they were doing with camps, what they were doing with uh, analytics. And, and you know, look, I think we get credited uh, a lot with having sort of perhaps catalyzed the use of analytics within the game. To be clear, I think we've actually, I think we've done certain things really well. I actually think we've fallen a bit behind <laughs> Uh, and actually, my, you know, my 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 number one priority right now is to hire a uh, um, you know a new chief analyst, chief data scientist within the franchise. Because when I look now, what for example, Billy does, Billy Bean does at, at, at the Oakland A's. You know, we're, we're we're a mile off it, and I think we've got a bit too consumed by what's going on in cricket rather than doing what we did ten years ago, which is look at what's going on outside of cricket. If I go hang out with the team you know, the Fenway sports have up at Liverpool, you know, it's it's miles ahead of where we are. And so, um, you know, while we've been a bit consumed over the last year with dealing with the challenges of COVID uh, and whether the tournament's on or off, analytics, you know, I think we, we, you know, we need a massive reinvestment in that. No, I, I think you're definitely right there. I, um, uh, I will apply for the job after the podcast. I won't do it now, but, but no, Please no, do. I... I I think you're right. If you if you uh, if you read a book like the MVP Machine, uh, was written by a couple of baseball writers, you do realise the the different levels and uh, and cricket is sort of stuck in. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's come incredibly far to be fair to it as well. But it's a little bit stuck in thinking about cricket, whereas I think the other sports have just uh, uh, bolted I away. I also think, Jared, I also think the analytics question is 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 misunderstood in the sense that. You know, whenever we talk about analytics, we, we, we've we got this image of a guy sh- staring at a, a laptop and sort of figuring out whether Neil Wagner's the best left armor in the New Zealand team or whatever it is, right? But to me, that's the easy part of the analytics conundrum. The, the, the much harder parts of the analytics conundrum are firstly, how do you get all the data that is out there? So in cricket, I think we capture you know, we capture some data. We've started to capture things like bat speeds. We've started to capture, you know, through Hawkeye trajectories of ball. But we haven't even really started. And, you know, and that, you know, that needs an inv- investment in cameras. It needs an investment in thinking about, you know, it takes on like field positions, right? That we haven't really moved the conversation around field positions forward like 30 years. I mean, the notion that we still have the same names for field positions when, Anyone knows now a 2020 field today on a quick wicket in India is utterly different to any field you could possibly set at Lords on a green wicket on a cold day. So, so firstly, there's what data sets do we go and look at and get? And there, I'm really interested in the whole psychology uh, triggers as well, because again, we've got we know anecdotes like, yeah, you know, Sansei's in a really good space. He's got married recently. He's a lot calmer. He's a lot more thoughtful about his game. How do you actually go and get, what data sets do you go and get? And the bit that's really hard uh, and the bit that I actually think we we collectively have to do a much better job is how do you get players to buy into the data? Right? That's yeah. what's really yeah. difficult, which is, you know, that you, you can take a, a, a gun gun player like a Josh Butler and have the best data and the best analysis on where he should or shouldn't bat in T20 cricket. But if you can't get him to buy into it, which, by the way, most analysts can't because analysts are of a particular type of DNA, it's kind of no point even bothering with the data. And it's a bit like I see that in business all the time where, you know, I, I work with brilliant technologists and brilliant uh, data analysts, but I, the data is only as effective as your ability to apply it. 
No, I mean, a lot of that resonates with my career. I, when people ask me how I, uh, how I got by as an analyst, I always say, well, I would just sit in the bar and make them think I was an alcoholic and they would come by and chat to me and they would forget that I was the analyst that we were talking about. So you always have to trick them and yourself. But it, all, all that is really interesting. The fielding stuff that you're talking about, uh, you know, spatial tracking cameras at cricket grounds is my absolute dream but i'm not i'm not going to i'm not going to nerd out on this because i've probably done an entire podcast about that before okay so you now have a team you've gone to america uh you you, you know that you, you you're learning about how to put a sporting franchise together kind of from the nuts and bolts how do you come up with names and colors and and all that sort of stuff and also with in your, in your situation you've changed your color palette how do, how do those yeah. sorts of things happen um, look, I think that's where the benefit of spending 22 years or, or certainly by 2008, uh, you know, at least 13 years or 10 years having built businesses from scratch. You know, like when you're building a, an Internet related business, you've got to do all of that stuff. You've got to come up with brands. You've got to come up with digital presence. So that stuff actually was relatively easy for us and it's a combination of hiring the right people using the right experts using the right agencies what was challenging actually about the ipl was the speed at which you had to do it. i mean everyone forgets from the, from the franchise award to the day the first ball was bowled in bangalore i think from memory it was about 38 days i mean it was some ridiculously short period of time and you know to sort of create all of that infrastructure in that time frame was very very difficult just on your color change um what are, there, there were sort of two drivers of that which were um if you look at if you look at the mumbai indians color pre uh rr getting suspended and, and ours then there was a kind of clear distinction in the blue the sort of while we were suspended the mumbai color got closer and closer to ours so we were quite you know we were keen to to keen to have a point of difference when we came back uh, and so that was forcing a lot of conversation about kit color and actually the pink came out of a decision we made to make a core purpose of the foundation of, of, of the franchise female empowerment in India and so we had it we, we actually first wore pink for a particular game where we, we announced the launch of our foundation and the fact that a significant share of our profits would go towards female empowerment causes from day one and we played in pink and actually the truth is I could give you a really sophisticated answer but the truth is everyone just said wow it looks really good on TV you know why don't you play in that all the time? <laughs> So that was when we said, actually, you know what? CSK have done a brilliant job of owning yellow. Let's own pink because it speaks to the female empowerment, which is what we want to be famous for. I mean, you, you, your team is, I, I find, Rajasthan, very, very interesting. I mean, you've got winning the title early on. You talked about the and the spot fixing. But, but the, the pink thing um, is another one where – uh, not only that, you had your players doing things for menstruation and um, everything during, I think it was during the last season, but also the push to England. Now, obviously, you are English-based, and as you said before, you don't have uh, business interests in India, but there hasn't been a, I wouldn't say that there's been a huge pickup of the IPL in, in England, and yet you, you know, well, your team has certainly been at the forefront of that. Is that because of a business idea, or is that because you're based here, or where, where's the thought process with that? Um. Again, I think like everything, there's a bit of a thought process, but there's also a, uh, a bit of circumstance and luck. Just to, just to say one thing, though, Jared, I don't know, you know, I think you're right about the IPL in, in England in terms of traditional cricket fans. I, it's still, you know, it's still growing. What's fascinated me about England, you know, as someone that lives here and is here, is how the IPL indexes amongst 10 to 18-year-olds. Oh, yeah. right? It's off the charts. And that, that was the revelation for me, at least. And that really took off when Sky, if you remember in the first few years, um, it kind of flipped between channels. Um, and then BT Sport and Sky really kind of got hold of it, I think in about season four, season five. Um, and, and it was properly, you know, it was consistently shown and they, they invested in the studios. Um, and because of the time of day, 3.30 to 7.30 um, or, or whatever it was, that was perfect for kids coming home from school. And so even though my mates would be like, yeah, this IPL stuff, I don't really watch it. Actually, my kids and their friends were like, they, they knew everything about the IPL and trading cards and stuff like that. So I think the UK is a really important market. I think it's a really interesting market. We've got the diaspora here. Everyone says, did you pick Butler, Stokes and Archer because they're English? And the answer is no. 
know, we picked Butler, Stokes and Archer because they're great players and we got them at good prices in the auction. That, to some extent, that is when our English fan following really took off because we had such an English backbone. But, you know, your player selection is made on the basis of cricketing needs. Um, but to come back to your question, you, we, we've been explicit that we want to be, you know, the international fans franchise of choice, both here, you know, in Australia and in the Caribbean. Tell me, take me I through. I can go a bit longer, by the way. Oh, okay. I can go a bit longer if you can. Well, excellent. I've, now I've got a couple more questions then. Beautiful. Here, here's one I want to know, and I want to know this from a lot of these leagues around the world, these T20 leagues, the teams are kind of pop up. So they only exist. They're almost like a rock concert and you bring in all the bands together and they disappear. The IPL is a little bit more, uh, what would you say, um, it, it exists a little bit more than that. I know that there is still uh, a disappearing act at a certain point. When you own a team that is suspended for two years, how do you run that? How does that work from a, from a logistics point of view? I know If that was in that CPL, I would know that it wouldn't matter because they don't have anyone there. But for you guys, you would have had staff and you know, all these different things. How does that work? Yeah, it's a really good question. And, it, and, it, and the short answer is tough, right? I mean, the, um, the first decision we made is, you know, we were going to keep, keep the team together, um, which we did. Um, that's bluntly a financial decision. It wasn't a um, there wasn't a huge amount for the team to do. Um, but the second thing, the the thing we did do, and 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 the way we did use that two year period was to do a ton of introspection around our structure and also our three to four year plan. And so we were really clear we had to change the ownership structure in some quite dramatic ways, and that takes that takes time. That takes planning that takes organization and we we're, we're probably half a step away from completing that in the next uh month or so um but we were you know i was very clear that you know i wanted to get sort of complete control of the franchise so that um so that the the noise as it were uh, would dissipate uh, so that was actually a, a chunk of work and, and and discussions with the bcci and working through some of that so that that kept at least half the team pretty busy and then the other half it was like okay when we come back what are we going to do differently what are we going to do differently commercially and what are we going to do differently from a playing perspective um and the, you know the two big themes we focused on there were you know we'd always set our goal as a franchise pre-suspension as making the playoffs right because we because we were operating on tight budgets we, we set our goal as making the playoffs and we said no we want to come back now post-suspension this will sound ironic given given what we've actually delivered, but, you know, and spend as much as anyone else and not be competitively disadvantaged by the salary purse and compete to win. And so we went for a very young squad that we felt we could build, you know, really invest in over four to five years. That was the cricketing decision. And then the off-field decision was, you know, I was embarrassed by actually our digital content and our, um, you know, digital presence. And given that that's supposed to be, what we do for a living, we really wanted to start investing there. The other big difference, of course, was pre-suspension, our franchise and, and most of the franchises weren't really making any money. I mean, they, they might have been making a bit or they might lose a bit depending on where they finished. But coming back post-suspension with a new TV deal in place, you suddenly had capital to invest. Right? So these franchises now, all of the franchises are now highly profitable and that gives you the capital to invest, which allows you to um, uh, to say, take some longer term and more thoughtful decisions. You guys obviously won in the first year. Um, you know, it was uh, I think it was a bit of an upset, even if we didn't really know what was going to happen in the league. You know, it, it was it was a bit of a surprise. You've you've said that you wanted to make the playoffs every year uh, after that, and now you want to go for more. How much smarter though do you think the league is now? You you kind of took everyone by surprise a little bit in that first year. Um, yeah, I mean, that's as, a great question. I mean, as an analyst, sometimes I look at it and I still think, oh, they don't teams don't need to be doing this. I mean, the first ball today, David Warner took a risky single, and I was like, he's been run out twice. You don't need risky singles. Please stop doing this. But it's still, it's quite clear. Some of the thinking and the thought process that goes into this, it just seems so much smarter. Whereas when you guys won the league, it was like a couple of teams were starting to cotton onto it and you guys just were ahead of the game. It's not like that anymore, is it? No, you're spot on. I mean, and I think that's where we've perhaps um, uh, 
underestimated sort of in having been out for two years and then coming back um you know i i think all the teams and when it comes to matchups whether it comes to analysts whether it comes to prep when it comes to nutrition whether it comes to training drills you know the margins between teams now are so so narrow you know the challenge you know i've put to the guys really for this next cycle because we've got a really big cycle coming up now which is the you know the big auction next year um is you know what are our new points of difference because right now i don't think we've got any i mean i think you know you in the auctions you used to you know you used to be able to spot a player and buy a player that literally no one else was bidding for you know that just doesn't happen anymore you know you might get a bit lucky on one player or, but but you know the data's out there the stats are out there um so yeah i'm sort of agreeing with you really um and i think you know but that's what i love that's what i love about again my day job with our digital businesses which is you know, points of difference only last for 12 months in the digital world. And what we're starting to see in the sporting world is points of difference only last for a couple of seasons. So you've got to be constantly challenging yourself. You know, I personally think, you know, this is where going back to one of your earlier questions, you need to ask more questions to people outside of the game. Mm. Like if I ask, if I only talk to cricket people about cricket, I sort of know what answers I'm going to get, especially from the greats of the game, right? Because, you know, what, why would they want to rewire their brains any differently? Whereas you go talk to Billy Bean about what he's doing, you know, with his analytics setup, or you go talk to you know, Billy Hogan about what he's doing commercially with his CRM platforms, or you, you know, that's where you push your learning and that's where you try things. And, and a bit like our day job, your cricket is not an environment where players naturally, coaches naturally, and, and owners naturally want to take risks. But I think you've got to, by definition, if you want to find a point of difference that's new, it's got to therefore be innovative and you've got to be prepared for it to be a failure. On, on a sort of total plan, you know, with everything you've just said, there, where do you see, I suppose, the league in 10 years and Rajasthan's place in the league? In, and I'm not saying you're going to own the team for the next 10 years. For all I know, you're about to do a big deal off, off camera here and sell the whole thing. But... But where do you see Rajasthan's place in the league? And also, where do you see the league um, um, going? Um, you know, I, in my again, back into my sort of day job as a sort of digital technology business builder, um, we tend to think in three-year cycles. I just think there's so much change and there's so much um, volatility in the world. So anything more than that sort of irrelevant. So if I answer the question with a three-year perspective, I think – um, I think that there are going to be some really important changes in the game over the next three years in terms of formats, in terms of number of games played, in terms of uh, recognition that the game is owned by the fans and by the players. I mean, some of the stuff that you highlighted, you know, and have highlighted in both your film documentaries and your podcast, these are actually really important issues. And I think sports fans are beginning to wake up finally that, you know, how the game is governed, um, how, you know, it's not as exciting as talking about whether Warner should bat one or three or Bearstow should bat two or four. It's not as exciting, but actually it's really important. So I think there's going to be a real, um, a really interesting period of change uh, around some of that stuff. And soccer's just highlighted that beautifully in the last week and a half, right? I mean, how soccer fans have been consumed by, by the governance of the game. And who, who would have thought that even six months ago? But, so I think there's going to be some big changes there. I think in terms of the IPL, the IPL is now a third of the world's cricket economy. It is the most important league in the economy. It, 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 you know, and with that comes responsibility. With that comes responsibility to think about what we're putting back into the game, what we're doing to develop the women's game, which I think, by the way, could absolutely fly across the world if we make the right choices around it what we're doing to develop young talent, but also what we're doing to develop other leagues in other countries. Because I, I don't think it's in the IPL's interest for there to be no other strong domestic competition. So we, there's a lot of things for the for the broader uh, sort of IPL ecosystem to think through um, and, to, uh, and, to, and to support. And I suppose to come to your actual question, where would I like Rajasthan to be? I'd like us to be famous 
for always just trying to um, you know push those points of difference it, you know to push those points of innovation to be trying things that are new you know we're never going to be the richest team we're never going to be um, you know the biggest team because we you know we don't have a captive area like Bombay Delhi or Calcutta so we're always going to be you know we're often cited as being everyone's second favorite team well that's not a bad place to be um, and then from a purpose perspective if we can impact female empowerment in India and if in seven years time you and I are having a beer and saying you know what the royals actually made a difference to female empowerment in India then I think we put something back into the country as well. Uh, it's it really really fascinating I'll, I'll let you go but uh, you know just last thing uh, when you own a team and the team is losing is that I mean you've been a fan of sports teams your whole life right and I know what it's like to work for a team but also know that at the end of the year, I might lose my job. This is your team until you sell it. Um, emotionally, is it a much higher level than being a normal fan? It, definitely. I mean, it's, uh, you know, that works both ways, right? When you win a game, you know, and when, like me, you're a pretty average sportsman and you kind of realise, you know, unfortunately, quite early on that you, you're never ever going to get close to any sort of elite sporting experience. Um, it's the sort of next best thing, right, in terms of the positives. And as you rightly say, when you lose, I mean, it's incredibly frustrating. And there's something about cricket, funny enough, where because, uh, I mean, you, you know, your Warner run out comment is a really interesting one. Because, because if you're a cricket fan, you're so consumed by specifics of the game and it, and, it, and everything's so measurable. Um, it's you know, whereas in a soccer game, you can sort of, you can watch a Liverpool Man U game and not get too excited about what the left back did because actually the left back was innocuous. In cricket, everything is so measurable and visible. You end up just kind of not sleeping for a night after you've lost and analysing each over and analysing the role of each player and analysing selection. And I, you know, I always said one of the rules I made when we got the franchise was, you know, there's a really important line from you know the dressing room door from the owners I, I, you know in South Africa they introduced this concept of owners dugouts and you know I said over my dead body are we ever going to sit in a dugout right I mean we're, we're owners we're not we're not part of the the, the, the playing squad so I've always been clear on that line but I'd also be lying if I said that there haven't been times when you cross the line with your opinions because you know you're in the bar and you're passionate and you care and uh, and you say things to people you perhaps shouldn't say so uh, that's why i'm in london why the ipl is going on in india i mean i've certainly never had uh, any conversations like that with any owners before but i would that i would like to speak about uh your book is called new innings you wrote it with yossa uh, so people can go out and get that but thank you very much for coming on the podcast not at all jared and if i could just do one uh, one plug which is much more important than the book yeah. Uh, you know, right now, it's a super important time. Uh, the next few weeks are going to be incredibly important for India. Uh, it's a really difficult time. You know, there's reported numbers, but, you know, everyone um, knows the impact of coronavirus right now is as dramatic as it can be. So if there's anything that your viewers, listeners can do to help, uh, and if, if there are viewers and listeners that don't know what they can do to help, you know, I just point you at the British Asian Trust emergency appeal because the one thing i'll guarantee is the money and we're raising you know hundreds of thousands of pounds right now um you know the the money that comes into that appeal will be very effectively deployed and uh, you know i just want to really uh, empathize with people in the country right now beautiful very well put thanks for coming on